both of those. Obi Ezekwes Willy um, is a fellow of the uh, Richard von Weizsäcker Fellow of the Robert Bosch Academy in Berlin. Uh, my friend and colleague Elsie Kanzer, Head of Africa at the World Economic Forum. I'm just going to ask them to put forward their view and, and, and why in particular we believe that you know, the current situation um, around xenophobia is not good either for South Africa or Nigeria but also for the, the whole of the region. Obi, you first. Um, so thank you very much, um, Oli. Um, I think that the first thing for us to uh, put our mind to is how Africa's growth and progress um, is empirically established to be very much dependent on the scale of economic activities that would happen on this continent in the next uh, couple of decades. There is an urgency for Africa to produce the economic growth that would lift uh, majority Africans out of poverty. We still have almost half of the continent's people in dire straits of poverty. And that must quickly be reversed. That's why um, fragmentation of the economies of Africa doesn't make any sense. You need scale, massive scale, and it's economic uh, integration that enables that scale to be achieved. In order for that scale to be achieved, the two anchor economies of South Africa and Nigeria have to lead by example. Leading by example means that they, they should be the champions of the latest agreements as a result of the treaty uh, for the Africa free trade, uh, free, uh, the Africa continental free trade um, agreement. They should be champions of it. They should exhibit uh, the, 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 the tendencies that show that progress will be made through the ASFTA. Now, empirically, we know that 1% growth in, in Nigeria or in um, South Africa creates a half a percent growth for the rest of the continent. I mean, you can't have Nigeria and South Africa not understand this leading role. It is unfair to the continent for it to be that any part of this, this continent would reverse the gains that are possible through closer integration of African economies. I believe that we have a crisis that is mounting, but we can de-escalate the crisis. The reason that a platform like WEF has been useful for us as a continent is that it has enabled public-private dialogue to happen. We need to put our voices as citizens on the continent and say to our leaders, rise to leadership. It is wrong for there to be no consequence for bad behavior that would reverse the gains of economic integration for our continent. I believe, um, Oli, that there are some important steps that the government of South Africa should be able to take immediately in order to send a signal to the people that have been victims of what I call Afrophobia. It's not xenophobia. I haven't seen any Italian or any European. I haven't seen any Chinese or Indian uh, being harmed, being maimed, being killed, losing properties. I haven't seen that. I have seen a targeting of especially my country, Nigeria. And I have seen a lot of um, single story where uh, people are saying things like, and I read something uh, recently that was released where it was, oh, you know, uh, Nigerians uh, uh, engage in uh, criminal activities in South Africa. Well, I also know that that's a single story. 18% of the people that teach in higher institutions in this country are Nigerian academics. Many Nigerian doctors are the ones who serve, provide health services in the rural areas of South Africa. They have lived peaceably here. This danger of a single story must be taken on by the government immediately to de-escalate any further degeneration and deterioration of relationship. So one, I think that 
the president of South Africa and the government should place it out there clearly that there would be speedy and conclusive prosecution of those that have been arrested so far for the latest violent um, upheaval. And then, second, the government, uh, the reason that I want that speedy uh, prosecution is that that's a departure from what we've seen in the past. In the past, we never really saw that there was consequence for that behavior. So if they did that this time, it would send a sharp signal on a vehicle that they would punish anyone who lays their hands on uh, people who are resident uh, in South Africa from the rest of Africa. Second is that the government um, must, the, the, the government must go out there and engage with the victims of the violence. There is almost a sense that the, there is no link and connection between the government right now and those who have been victims. It shouldn't happen because what it sends is a signal. People, some people are saying there's a tacit approval of this conduct by the government. I don't want to believe that. But if the government does not engage with the victims of these violence in the way that has happened so many times, it's a serial act that is almost amounting to savagery. We shouldn't in any way not punish this. Let the president, let his government connect with the victims, have a discussion with them, assure them that they are welcome in this country. It would help in giving them the social license that they require to be calm and to feel a part of this, uh, of this country. Yesterday, Oli, I met with Nigerians who live in Western Cape. And they were saying, some of us have lived here 25 years. Many of us are married to South Africans. We have children that are South African Nigerian. What exactly is going on? So, this I, has to change. I mean, Minister, this has to change. Minister Mbeweni, yesterday during the opening plenary, um, mentioned that any Nigerian that wants to live in South Africa is welcome to live in South Africa. You urged South Africans and people from all over Africans to call themselves Africans. He also mentioned the, he referred to the Continental Free Trade Agreement um, as a, the, the greatest, biggest thing that's happened to Africa since post, the post-colonial era. Are you satisfied by the language and the strength of the signal that, that he is putting forward on behalf of the government? I am not. I am not. It's not adequate. It is too tentative. It is not as reassuring as, sh as it should be. So what I think the problem is, is a failure to act. Okay. There's a failure to act, and that needs to change. Uh, and, and let's just also look, because there are the, this is an issue that just moves beyond South Africa, and of course, back to Nigeria. What do you say to people back home in Nigeria who are criticizing you and others at this meeting for, for attending this meeting here? You see, when there is a failure on the part of the governmental systems, the citizens must make sure that there's no failure on their part. It was very important for me to be able to put my voice out here that South Africa must do the right thing. My own country must do the right thing. The two countries need to come to the table immediately and, and de-escalate this. And you see your message to the Nigerian leadership is? My message to the Nigerian leadership is that they should be open to a, an overture by the government of South Africa to de-escalate this on the basis, on the basis that the South African government will do a number of the things that I have said. Visit the people, make a swift prosecution process to punish people who have done this kind of behavior, make sure that you know, you can even consider a set aside for compensation to victims of these kinds of acts. And number four thing that I, uh, that, that I think that the government of, of South Africa uh, needs to do is that it really needs to offer a sincere apology to the whole continent. Across the continent right now, people need to hear. 
type of questions will, will follow. Elsie, uh, representing the World Economic Forum. Of course, we are the World Economic Forum. We see we like to build our aspirations for better societies around the, the, the economical progress. What's, what's our view? What's your message to the leadership here in South Africa, in Nigeria, and, and your message to leaders across Africa? So the World Economic Forum uh, will turn 50 years next year. And uh, a big part of what we do is, for, is fostering trust and um, supporting and enabling dialogue uh, between different stakeholders. Uh, so not just public-private sectors we had, but also opening up the space uh, for other critical voices, particularly when there are failures in leadership by government uh, and business in particular as being the, the power brokers. And during that time, what we have seen um, across the world uh, in different areas is that conflicts easily escalate and move into positions that are very difficult to, to recover from. And therefore, we spend a lot of our time um, enabling conversations uh, to bridge the gaps in, in understanding and address grievances uh, by different parties so that we can support uh, progress, uh, we can support the ensuring that we're able to deliver to the citizens, which is what we purport to, to stand for. We all want a better world, and uh, conflict just does not allow for that. Uh, these kinds of tensions uh, hurt everyone. Uh, so both in, in South Africa and Nigeria, it's not just Nigerians who suffer in South Africa, and it's not just uh, South Africans who suffer in Nigeria. Uh, properties are owned by locals in some cases. You have employees who are, who are local. And as, uh, as Madame Obi shared, you have integrated uh, societies as well, where there's intermarriage um, and other forms of, uh, of integration. And particularly in the context of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, uh, what is a great concern uh, to me is, uh, and if you allow me today to just walk back a little bit into a history of two years, uh, which was that in Durban, during the last World Economic Forum on Africa 2017 meeting, um, our youngest uh, youth community, the Global Shapers, who were there from all around Africa, committed to drive an Open Africa initiative. So during that time, the FCFTA was still under negotiation. Already they were sharing concerns about issues and whether the people are being brought along uh, on this integration journey. Mm. And they undertook to try to travel across Africa by bus. <laughs> Right? not by air, and see how easy or difficult it is. The truth is they were not able to, visas, uh, infrastructure, but wherever they went, they also held local conversations about what open Africa meant to ordinary Africans. And, and the reality is, is, is stark. You know, there's this serious resistance um, and, and fear about others coming in and taking jobs, etc. So. The second concern here is we, we really need to listen to the people and see how to address uh, differences in perspectives. Uh, very often it's not factual. Uh, we assume a lot and, and we have to also advocate for responsible leadership to correct misperceptions because misperceptions in information um, has consequences and the consequences can be, can be grave. Um, and the last aspect, uh, which has become increasingly clear here uh, with respect to urgency, is that critical voices are not being heard. And so we as a forum are trying, as, as, as we are with this, to expand the space for the voices of ordinary people to be heard such that leaders um, are, are realize that they need to take action on things. And, and too often, the spaces for that, for that kind of dialogue, are missing. This meeting is the largest meeting for our strategic partner community outside of Davos. There's a tremendous and growing interest amongst the world's largest businesses, deep-pocketed, far-sighted organizations that see long-term value and potential in this region. What do you think the message will be coming from them? Uh, it's in the interest of, of all of us to resolve such uh, uh, tensions as fast as possible, um, as, as amicably as possible, and as peacefully as possible. Uh, because it is very easy to destroy through mm. violence, but very difficult to rebuild. Um, and at least the commitment from the foreign's perspective, uh, we launched a peace building platform last year, which is not necessarily for major conflicts per se, wars, etc. but we're seeing an increase in a 
proliferation in civil protests, um, and, which are violent, across Africa just over the past two years, which means that we need to be much more deliberate about the dividends that were fought for uh, to create peaceful democratic societies because once it's very easy to burn, we can't afford to burn. Mm. Questions? Okay, lady at the back row. Just because I know you doesn't mean everybody else does. So please <laughs> give us your name, tell us where you're from. Sure, uh, Heidi Jockers from ENCA. Uh, I just want to pose a question to you about, uh, you know, you're speaking about xenophobia, but I also know that you're very vocal about uh, and, and you, you know, you've been very involved in uh, the movement of Bring Back Our Girls. And currently we have a, a major problem in South Africa with gender-based violence. Um, and the president addressed the nation yesterday about, you know, action that wants to be taken. But uh, what is your approach on dealing with gender-based violence and issues around the abduction of young children? Mm. Okay, so gender-based violence will take two or three at a time. Uh, the lady there, please, yes. Hi, it's Pranesh Naidu from Bloomberg News. I just want to get your take as to whether the tensions between the two uh, countries pose any threat to the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and progress that's being made there. Okay, risks to the trade agreement. The lady next to you. Uh, it's Lamiz Omurji from Fin24. Um, yesterday, uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa sent out a uh, message uh, to the citizens. It was firstly about gender-based violence, and then he ended it off um, discussing... Um, the xenophobia, and I wanted to hear from you, do you think uh, that's, um, we're taking the right steps as a government, or would you would want him to have said more and actually apologized at, at that, in that message? Okay, last lady there, thank you. Hi, my name is Lilian Chijingi from Arise News. Sorry, I'm going to deviate a little bit from the xenophobia. I'm going to talk about Robert Mugabe. We just heard he died today. Um, what do you think he should be remembered for, and what can you say about his economic policies? Because he's been criticized in that regard. Okay, let's take uh, the lady here on um, gender-based violence, Heidi's question here. You, Heidi, you should have come to our press briefing yesterday. <laughs> what I can tell you is in the, in the closing plenary, which will start, one of the key outcomes will be the, um, the deliberations and the ac action that was taken as a result of this press conference. And from the lady to my immediate left, um, yesterday who's got together a bit of a coalition and can, we can actually announce that something is happening as a result of this meeting. Um, we'll be hearing more about that in the closing plenary. But um, Obi, it's definitely a good platform for you to remind us um, you know, what you think the, the actions from this meeting should be as a, you know, with regards to gender-based violence. So uh, part of what we agreed is that it has to be a sustained focus on it and that the platform of, of WEV, now having taken this on in a very significant way, uh, starting with uh, what was discussed at, at, the, at the meeting um, yesterday, uh, can be a major global voice for addressing gender-based violence. And that second, uh, there are legal issues involved and that enforcing the laws and also um, making sure that countries that don't have the laws that punish that bad behavior must have those kinds of laws. And the ones that don't, uh, that have, but are not enforcing, it is urgent for there to be uh, consequences for um, uh, violating the rights of women. And then we talked about the voice, the fact that any uh, violence against a girl or a woman is to shut down their voice. No one has a right to do that. And that you know, the, the agency and, and the power that, that people must have to, to be able to express an opinion, be a woman, a thrive in the workplace, uh, live peaceably at home, and not be discriminated because of the agenda, uh, that that right needs to be enforced and needs to be respected. And we also talked about the role of the private sector in, in this process. We went all the way to uh, the role of family level, uh, this social conditioning that the male child is preferred to the girl child and, and therefore that grows through and the patriarchy and the misogyny that it entrenches within society. We need to radically end it and, and that it will take a coalition of effort uh, at international level, at national level, and uh, family as well as business level at government. Um, there are also issues of policy. Uh, there are a number of policy measures that can be taken that would help 
uh, to, to reduce the scourge of gender-based violence. Uh, I think that all in all, people left uh, that conversation uh, assured of the, uh, the, the many uh, tools that we can use to, to attack this, because it's a global problem. And it, it is reducing the productivity of the world for women to be scared that they would be beaten, they would be shot down, they would be raped, and all kinds of things would happen to them, and there would be no consequence. That's impunity. The world cannot live with this impunity going on against women. Right, now we have only a few minutes before the closing plenary starts, so I'm going to ask you just to cover very, very quickly, you know, a few words, answers for the rest. Uh, Elsie, you wanted to make a quick comment about this? Yes, uh, just talking about the inclusivity of voices and, and building on what Madame Obi said. I've had a number of men approach me and say, you know, we're not all bad, but there's no space for dialogue that includes us in the conversation so that we can also be part of the solution in addressing um, the bad apples among them. So this is just uh, yeah. an input. Let's, let's not leave the men who are supportive of a different reality and a safer space and more secure world for women. Great point. Okay, uh, free trade agreements, any risks? Quick, yes, no answer. Big, big risk. Uh, yeah. Okay. Because you need national domestication. Fine. Uh, Roman Poser, uh, he sent a strong message yesterday. I suspect I know what you're going to say. Not strong enough. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about time here, nothing uh, else. Ali, as you've had throughout this meeting, people are tired of talk. They want action. Yeah. So for everything we've said with these issues, with other issues, action will speak louder than words. Yes. Okay, one word on Sir Mugabe. How, how will he be remembered? As a, as a, it's a conflicted as a conflicted um, legacy. Perfect. Conflicted Elsie. legacy. Um, I concur. Great. Thank you so much. This is now over. We have a closing plenary to attend. Oh, thank you.